today on Living Power. And, and it's, it's, it's important for us to understand that, that we need the Word of God to help us develop and grow and to transition from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of heaven. Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord. Let's give him this time and uh, let's pray that God will speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for the privilege of studying your word, of seeking your face, of believing that you have a purpose and a plan for our lives and discovering more of what that's all about. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us this morning through your word and take this passage and apply it to our lives, I pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible to teach uh, because it's so misunderstood. It's the first shall be last, the last shall be first, you know, that sort of thing. And um, it, is, it is one of those passages that people have so misinterpreted and so misunderstood through the years. And, uh, and so I love teaching this because so many times people go, oh, I'd never seen it that way before. Well, and I hope that you'll see something in, in, the, in the study today that you can take and apply in your life. Let's look at our passage in Matthew chapter 19, starting with verse 23. And Jesus said to his disciples, now, first of all, remember, this is just coming off of the, the connection that he, or this event where he talks to that rich uh, young guy that, that uh, uh, said, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, go sell everything, then come and follow me. And the guy said, I can't do that. And he went away because he had so many riches. And he was all about his wealth. And he wasn't willing to do what Jesus said he needed to do to follow him. So on the heels of that, here we are. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? In other words, what's in it for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world... When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first." Now, there are so many things in this passage of Scripture that we could focus on and study today. We could be here for hours and hours and hours looking at this passage. For example, what, is, what does it mean? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I remember in seminary, one class, the professor spent more time on these verses 23 and 24. He took the whole class period to just kind of explain it away you know, and what it meant. Now, well, really, the eye of a needle is actually a gate, and there is a gate in the city that's called the eye of a needle, and it would be difficult. Uh, it's real small, and camels can't really get through it because it's, oh, man. And he missed the whole point of the passage, you know, as far as I'm concerned. You know, and what about this? What about this passage? This, uh, that, uh, the, this is one of the guarantees. You know, you, there's a great study that you can do about the guarantees in the Bible. This is a guarantee. You know, if, if God guaranteed you something, would you, would you take him up on it? Of course you would. You say, at least we say we would. Um, but here's a guarantee that, you know, if, if anybody who follows Christ gives up their, their, the things that are important to them, and make him more important, there's a guarantee that they will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Now that's a guarantee. You've got a warranty in life. You've got a life warranty on you. And, and this, is, this is a passage that we could study also. But what I want to focus on is what does this mean? Many who are first will be last and the last first. And in order to really understand this passage, we have to understand the terms and the phrases that, that Jesus is using. Now, the whole passage, as I mentioned, is horribly misunderstood. And the, uh, the, the common thought that people have is that it's talking about how difficult it is for a rich person or anyone else for that matter to get into heaven. 
And l let me establish right up front here that that's a wrong interpretation. Um, it's, it is, it, the, the whole idea here is that um, if you interpret this passage that way, to say, oh, it's Im almost impossible for a rich person to go to heaven. If you interpret it that way, you're completely missing the point of how a person gets to heaven. Because eternal heavenly life is a gift from God. It's not earned. And it is not humanly purchased. Nor is it deserved. So a rich person doesn't deserve heaven, nor does a poor person. You don't deserve heaven. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a gift. You don't earn it. It's not a reward for something, for being a good person. It's not, uh, it's not you, you don't gather up points so that you can get into heaven. And a lot of people live their life that way. I've got to gather points. I'm cramming for heaven. And that's not, the Bible says that's not how it is. And so to interpret this passage as, oh, it's saying that rich people, it's harder for rich people to get into heaven or to, to get to heaven because they're rich is not the point at all. You're missing the whole point of what this is all about. So clearly, Jesus' comments in Matthew are not about getting into heaven. Because getting into heaven is something that God does, not something that you do. You don't earn heaven. You don't deserve heaven. The problem with that kind of interpretation is that people confuse the terms the kingdoms of heaven, and the, or the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And uh, they, they confuse it as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God as being heaven and or eternal life. And that's not what this, that's, that's a, an incorrect interpretation. Jesus uses the terms kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God as terms that are inclusive of earth. They're talking about heaven, but they're also talking about earth. Or perhaps we could say it, the, that it is heaven and heaven on earth. When we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about heaven, but we're also talking about heaven on earth. You see, because the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven exists wherever God is. If we say that the kingdom of heaven is heaven, then that's because that's where God is, then what do we say about earth and the presence of God on earth? You see, the kingdom of God exists wherever God is. Wherever God reigns, that's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was making this comment on the heels of this encounter with, with the rich young ruler, as I explained earlier. And, uh, and when he was confronted with his real need, the young man went away because he, he couldn't handle the truth. And, be, and really what, what that example, what happened there was that we saw somebody who was entrenched in the kingdom of the world. It was the things of the world that were more important to him than the things of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. The ways of the world were more important. The, the, the definitions of success and the good, the way the world uh, defines good, those things were more important to him. And so the kingdom of the world is about how the world defines success and good and the way you should live your life. And so Jesus was commenting on how difficult it is for such a person uh, rich or not, to walk away from the kingdom of the world and transition into the kingdom of heaven. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about getting into heaven. He was talking about discovering the kingdom of God on earth, transitioning from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of God on earth or the kingdom of heaven on earth. So for the next few minutes, I want us to take a look at the differences between the kingdom of the world, which is existent in the world today, and the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And those terms, by the way, are used interchangeably. Uh, you, you find, in fact, you'll find verses in the Bible where in one gospel it'll, it'll refer to Jesus saying the kingdom of heaven, and in another gospel it says, well, he said the kingdom of God. They're the same term. Now, I know that there are people and Bible students and Bible teachers that say, well, the kingdom of heaven is this and the kingdom of God is that. And I'm right. Uh, the, the terms are interchangeable, you know, in, 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 the, in the New Testament. So, 
Uh, so the kingdom of heaven, if I say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, I'm talking about the same thing, and you know that. So our discussion today is about the difference between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not talking, when I talk about the kingdom of the world, I'm not talking about political kingdoms. I'm not talking about oh, politics. You know, all oh, the kingdom of the world is, you know, they're, they're all a bunch of people that are just trying to, you know, it's the, man, you can get, you can get so involved, and I have, my family um, loves to discuss politics. They do, not my mom, mom and dad weren't in, into that. Well, my dad was a little bit. But boy, my brothers and my sister and I, uh, man, we can get into some great discussions. And, you know, because they're wrong. And so I, you know, it's important to straighten them out uh, and to convince them how wrong they are. And um, uh, we can get into those discussions into politics and, and judge the world by the politics of the world. But the truth of the matter is that's really, the politics don't define the world. The world defines the politics. The condition of the world is what defines the condition of our politics. You want to look at Congress, look at your neighborhood, look at your community, look at your city, look at your state. You know, Congress is in the condition it's in because of the condition of the people. And so it is, it, 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 the mess that we've got in Washington is, it's not their fault, it's our fault as people. Because, let's face it, we voted them in. And so we can blame them for all of the problems, oh, they're so corrupt and everything. But aren't people in general? Isn't the world corrupt? Isn't the way of the world corrupt? I mean, everything that we see, I mean, let's face it, Washington, D.C. is a microcosm of the rest of the United States. And so um, what we're looking at is, is not so much politics, but we're looking at truly the kingdom of the world. What is it that the world is and how does the world function versus how does the kingdom of heaven function? Now, as Christians, we're called to live out the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's our calling in life. That's what God expects from us. Live the kingdom of God. And that brings obvious conflict with the kingdom of the world. Uh, because the, the, the problem is that the kingdom of the world has a whole different lifestyle, a whole different value system, a whole different purpose, a whole different focus, different goals than the kingdom of heaven. And when you have all of these things in conflict with each other, lifestyle, value, purpose, focus, and goals, there is a stark contrast in the world between our way of life as Christians and the way of the world. But you see, when we follow the kingdom of heaven, when we follow the kingdom of God, then we find that we are living at a whole different level. And the problem is that creates a conflict between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the world. The world hates the way we live. And the truth of the matter is, we hate the way the world lives. I want us to look at this conflict of the kingdoms, and I want to look at five ways the kingdom of the world conflicts with the kingdom of heaven. Five ways the kingdom of the world conflicts with the kingdom of heaven. First of all, the kingdom of the world is threatened by the kingdom of heaven. I find it odd that the kingdom of the world finds the principles of the kingdom of heaven uh, to be a threat to society. Uh, it, it's just almost humorous to me. It's sad, but it's really kind of funny when you look at it and say, seriously, you have a problem with the things that we value? Every day, we who believe in the principles of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, we're told that we're a threat to society. I mean, when you think about it, that's just bizarre, is it not? I mean, make no mistakes about it. Some of the accusations about Christians, people who call themselves Christians, are legitimate. I mean, there are people who call themselves Christians who are nothing but hate groups. And, and that doesn't come from the kingdom of God. That comes straight out of the pit of hell. Uh, racial inequality. 
It does exist among some people who call themselves Christians. But that's not from the kingdom of heaven. That's sin. Uh, there are people who call themselves Christians that abuse women and children. Uh, but that doesn't come from the kingdom of heaven. That comes from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the world. Uh, uh, you know, and there are people who call themselves Christians who lie and steal and cheat. Hello? But that doesn't come from the kingdom of heaven. That comes from the kingdom of the world. I, uh, a few years ago, I sat with a young man who was dying. He had cancer. And um, he had... He was out of jail, but he had been in jail for being a pedophile. And uh, he wanted to talk about, you know, his, his, his life as he was, you know, trying to, he was dealing with the fact that he was going to die. And, uh, and, I, and I said, and I called him by name, and I said, let me just ask you, you know, I'm asking from a human standpoint, but I'm, I'm really trying to understand this so that I can, uh, uh, deal with other people that may have this issue. I said, why did you do it? Why did you do those things? And he said, he said, it was, it was a, a, for, he said, for me, it was an act of control. He said, I didn't have control of my life. He said, the only thing I could control were children, or I thought I could control them. And he said, it was all about me. He said, I was, it was all about my, what I wanted. And I felt like I couldn't get anybody else to give me what I wanted, but I could control children. And so he said it was all about a control thing. And he said, I was in such darkness. And he said, I was afraid. He said, I didn't know what, what was happening to my life. But he said, the one thing I could control was how I treated children. And, uh, and he said, and that's really where it all started. And I thought, how depraved, how, you know, I, in, on the one hand, I wanted to punch the guy in the throat. On the other hand, I felt so bad for him. And for the children. You know, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we're living in a world of darkness. And there is so much that goes on in the darkness, even the darkness so much that we don't see what's going on. But the issue is that the world has its own set of values against the values of the kingdom of God. And Christians in the church are under assault for two main reasons. Number one, because of Christians who are still living in the kingdom of the world. And number two, because the kingdom of the world is threatened by the kingdom of heaven. And every day when we pray, our Father in heaven, holy is your name, uh, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every time we pray that, we're praying that God would eradicate sin from among us, but we're also praying that the kingdom of God overwhelm the kingdom of the earth. May your kingdom come and overwhelm the kingdom of the world. Jesus said it this way, though. He said in John 16, 13, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But look at this, but take part, uh, take heart, oh, take part. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, I want you to think about that, because when Jesus said that, he hadn't died on the cross yet. But he was saying that he had overcome the world. What did he mean by that? Well, here's what he meant. He overcame the world by his life. He was above all of that. He was saying that I have overcome the world. The world did not overcome me. My life is such that I did not bend to the will of the world. And the truth of the matter is what Jesus was saying was, in me, you can overcome the world. You can overcome the world. You can live your life in such a way that is above the way of the world, the kingdom of the world. So the kingdom of the world is threatened by the kingdom of heaven. That's never going to change. The world is threatened by you because you're a Christian. You are an assault. You are an affront to their way of life. Second thing is that the kingdom of heaven sheds light on the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of heaven sheds light on the kingdom of the world. It's not the other way around. 
kingdom of the world does not shed light on the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven sheds light on the kingdom of the world. John 3, 19 uh, through 21 says this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You know, one of the reason people, one of the reasons people don't come to church is because they're afraid of being exposed. They're afraid that they're going to be judged. And the truth of the matter is, they're already judged. They're, they've already been judged. Christ on the cross already judged their sin. And so, the, but they, they're afraid that they're going to be judged for who they are. And, and, and a bad person should not come to church. Well, in that case, only one of me should be here. All of us, all of us should be gone. Because, I mean, let's face it, the church isn't a place for perfect people. It's a hospital for sick people, for, hus for sinners. You know, and so when, when, when somebody comes through those doors, I, I can, I'll never forget this in Honduras. In Honduras, the church is uh, they're a lot smaller, and some of you may have experienced this, you know, in, 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 if you were in smaller churches that were in a, in a town or, or in a city. But in Honduras, as growing up on the mission field, our churches, we'd have a service, and, you know, the doors would stay open and the windows were open. We didn't have air conditioning, so everything was open, so there'd at least be some air moving through. And it was, I mean, it was a regular occurrence for a drunk to walk in. And I always thought it was humorous, you know. I mean, I'm a kid, you know, and I'm seeing some drunk come in and wanting to sing, you know, wanting to direct the singing, you know, and just act like an idiot. I always thought, oh, this is going to be fun, you know. But, you know, as I grew older, I began to observe this, that there were people in the church that went and loved on that person. Instead of saying, oh, you've got to leave. You can't come back until you're sober. Now, we do that. You know, I've seen that done in churches. You know what? You, you know, you really smell of whiskey. Usually, it's the deacons that know the smell. And so, <laughs> and so they'll say, you know, you, 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 you need to come back when, when you haven't been drinking. By the way, I'm kidding. We've got deacons in this class. It's always just a way of jabbing them, you know. I'm having fun with them. I, I think we have some of the godliest men in our deacon group. I really do. I really do believe that. And, and I thank you, deacons, for applauding. Um, but, but I still, I'm still going to pick on them because they're so pickable. Um, but, you know, we, 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 tend to, we tend to hold people away because they're in the kingdom of the world when we need to be inviting them in to connect and see what it is that happens in our lives or what God's done in our lives. And let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. You know, you know God doesn't save good people. He saves sinners. And so uh, that means that as Christians, we don't need to be ministering to good people. We need to be ministering to sinners. People who need Christ and know that. They may not understand it, but they know that they need help. They know they need something. So the kingdom of heaven sheds light on the kingdom of the world. And, um, and that's one of the reasons that, that the world hates those who live in the kingdom of God. Because it sheds light on, and the truth exposes the darkness of the world. The third thing is that the kingdom of the world operates out of fear. I mentioned this uh, I don't know, several months ago, uh, the European Journal and Organizational Psychology published an article last year that was titled, Fear of Losing Power Corrupts Those Who Wield It. And I thought, oh, I've got to read this. You know. uh, and while the article primarily deals with uh, workplace scenarios, people who are in charge and work, you know, and, and are in control at work, the principle applies to the whole uh, structure of authority, if you will. And this, uh, here's a quote from the article. Fear of power loss may prompt leaders to engage in self-serving behavior by prioritizing their self-interest at the expense of others' interests. 
Hello? And what that's saying is that when you operate and make choices out of fear, you make bad choices. And you've heard me say that before. If you make a decision out of fear, you've probably made the wrong decision. Now, you can get lucky and make the right decision, but for the wrong reason. But when you operate out of fear, you're going to end up making bad choices in your life. The kingdom of the world is operating out of fear and making bad choices and bad decisions. But look at what God has for us. 2 Timothy 1.7, one of the first verses I ever memorized. For God has not given, or God gave us a spirit, not, every translation says it just a little different and I get a little confused. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Now that's what God has given us. That's how God wants us to operate. Do you see what God is saying here? When you operate within the kingdom of heaven, you don't operate out of fear. You operate out of power, out of love, out of self-control or discipline. That's what God wants in and through your life. And so if you make decisions out of fear, you're making wrong choices. Now, understand that there is a healthy fear. I mean, let's face it. You know, a dog starts running at you. You know, it's, I'm not going to be afraid. Oh, yes, you are. That's a different kind of fear, you know. I love, I, I, I do these narrations for TV and do these auditions all the time. And I just did one for National Geographic on uh, uh, surviving the wild or something, something to that effect. And uh, it, it, the whole idea of this documentary was if you're in the wild, what should you do or what should you not do? And one of the segments was uh, uh, surviving a bear attack. And what should you do and what should you not do? And I, honest to Pete, I could not get through it without giggling. Because the fact is that you can learn all these things of what you should do and should not do. But when fear takes over, it controls you. You know, that's what happens, you know. <clears throat> and this, one of the things was you should walk steadily but quickly away from the bear. Dude, I'm telling you right now, there ain't no such thing as walking steadily and quickly away from a bear that wants to bite you in the backside. That just doesn't happen. Now, that's a healthy kind of fear. That's, you know, that's different. But when you're talking about fear of, of uh, losing everything or fear of, of a person or, you know, a fear of Oh, what are we going to do if so-and-so gets elected president? That's a whole different kind of fear. That is making decisions out of fear that will come back to haunt you. God says don't operate out of fear. The fourth thing is that the kingdom of the world operates out of self-indulgence. Uh, I want you to understand the magnitude of this because it will help you to understand the motivation behind the kingdom of, of the world. Uh, look at Galatians 5. Uh, Galatians 5, starting with verse 19, says this. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, it's not saying that you won't get into heaven because you can be saved and, and be a drunk. I mean, that's just, there are people who get saved who have a problem with that. And if you die and you're drunk and you're saved, you're going to end up in heaven. You'll stagger for a while, but you're going you're to make it to heaven. Because it was Jesus' blood that got you into heaven, not your purity. So I believe, and I, I do believe in the security of the believer, and I believe that there are people, Christians, who, who do some of this stuff that are from the kingdom of the world. There are Christians who are impure. There are Christians who, uh, who, who have strife in their life and jealousy and fits of anger and so forth and so on. But that's the way, what this is saying is that's the way of the world. That's the kingdom of the world. Those are characteristics of the kingdom of the world. But the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven, as we've already alluded to, is in Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. Now, I want you to note the remarkable difference of what motivates, what drives these different characteristics between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of heaven. 
Look again at the characteristics uh, of the kingdom of the world. All of these things, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, uh, so forth, dissensions, you know, drunkenness, all of those things. Every one of those characteristics that's mentioned in that passage there, every one of those characteristics is motivated by self-indulgence. It's, it's, every one of those things is for the purpose of satisfying a personal indulgence. They're all driven, all motivated by self, what I want. This is what I want. On the other hand, the characteristics of the kingdom of heaven are driven, uh, are motivated for the benefit of others. Look at that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those are driven, are motivated for the benefit of others. So the kingdom of the world is driven by self. What's motivating to self, what I want, when the kingdom of heaven is motivated by what's best for you. So when you're challenged by the kingdom of the world, just remember what's motivating that assault. When you are challenged, when you are assaulted by the kingdom of the world, remember what it is that's assault. What's driving that assault? What's motivating that? It's self-indulgence. When the world attacks you, it's motivated by self-indulgence. It's motivated because it hates you, you know, because you're, you're a Christian. But what motivates it is that it's this is what I want. I want my way of life. And you are saying that my way of life isn't acceptable. You are criticizing my way. of It's all about me. It's my way of life. But the kingdom of God is different, which brings us to the, uh, uh, the fifth point, and that is the kingdom of the world does not operate out of integrity. The kingdom of the world operates this way. It has no integrity and it can't be trusted. But Proverbs 10.9 says this, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his way crooked will be found out. So there's a, a difference. You are either going to walk in integrity, and because you're walking in integrity, you know you're walking in integrity, and you're secure in that. But the person who does not walk in integrity is afraid of being found out. But the kingdom of heaven operates with integrity. Psalm 7, 8 says, The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. Now, if God judged you on the basis of your integrity, what would his judgment be? If God judged your business and the, or the way you do business on the basis of your integrity, what would his judgment be? You see, this is how God has called us to live. And it's not just the opposite of the kingdom of the world. It's just God's way. It's God's nature. It's the character of God. Titus 2, starting with verse 7, says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, that's a, the, that word is the word for integrity, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The kingdom of heaven <coughs> is about everything that the kingdom of the world is not. But it's not about being opposite. It's about being godly. See, I don't look at the world and say, oh, they're going to act that way. I'm going to act this way. That's not, that's not right. What I need to be looking at is that God, I want to act the way God wants me to act. I'm not going to act the way the, God, the world acts. I don't want to act that way. I want to act the way that God acts. I want to define my life by that standard, not by the world standard. Because when I judge myself on the basis of the world, I'm pretty cool. You know, because I don't do all of those things in the world. Well, some of them, but not all of them. But when I judge myself by God, then I realize there's the standard for my life. That's what God wants out of my life. Now I have a focus and a goal and a path to walk. I know where I'm supposed to be. Um, 
the kingdom of the world is is about everything that the kingdom of uh, the kingdom of heaven is about everything that the kingdom of the world is not but not because we're trying to be different it's because we are different because our focus is on god and Colossians 1, starting with verse 9, talks about that. The Apostle Paul was, was talking about that. And he said, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to his, glor- his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Not one time in that passage does he say, look at the world and be different. No, he says, look at God and be right. So how do you transition from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, as it were? How do you transition? How do you move from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of heaven? Well, the follow-up verses in this passage in Colossians tell us what has to happen. I love this passage. This is another one of the first verses that I memorized. Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I love that. Because that exactly explains what happens when you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, do you see this, the, the important statement at the very beginning of this verse? He has delivered us. This is critical to understand, and it explains a lot of why it's so difficult for people who are caught up in the kingdom of the world to discover the kingdom of God. You can't deliver yourself. You can't do it. I'm going to be good from now on. Every one of you has said that at some point in your life. And you know what? You are blowing smoke because you can't deliver yourself. You know, I can't remember, and I did this as a parent. I said, no, uh, son, uh, I, I, I don't want you to do that again. I won't do that again. Next Tuesday, now, son, I told you, don't do that again. I'm not going to do it again. The next week, over and over again. Why? Because when it's you making the decision, you can't. Deliver yourself. You need, you know, I love our, our friends in, in AA who have this, uh, this uh, who, well, in many groups, but this idea of a higher power that I am, I am beholden to a higher power. I cannot deliver myself from my problem. I need a higher power. Well, that's what the Word of God teaches. And so this idea is that you cannot deliver yourself from the domain of darkness. God has to be the one that delivers you. And the way he does it is through Jesus, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Now, get this. What that verse says is that Jesus is the only way we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. What it's saying is that he delivers us from the domain of darkness. He transfers us to the kingdom of his beloved son, that's Jesus, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Now I want you to get this. He delivers you into his kingdom, and in doing so, at the same time, you have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You don't have redemption and forgiveness of sins, and then he transfers you to the kingdom. It all happens as he delivers you, as he develops you, as you transition from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of God. Now, there may be other people that show us good ways, show us good ways to live, and show us how to behave, and show us good and and are good examples in our life. But this passage says that Jesus is the only one who delivers us from darkness and the only one who redeems us and the only one who forgives our sin. So everybody else who claims to be a follower of whatever, they may be following them because they're good examples for life, but only Jesus can forgive your sin and only Jesus can redeem you and only Jesus delivers you into the kingdom of God. 
Jesus made that very clear when he was speaking to Thomas and the other disciples. It's in uh, John 14, and Jesus said to him, Thomas and the disciples were with him there, and he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, and I, always, and I always come back to this verse. I always come back to this passage, and I think about other people say, well, you know, we're all worshiping the same God. Well, you might be worshiping the same God, but you know what? The Bible says that in the end times, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord in heaven and earth and under the earth. What that's saying is that even people in hell will be worshiping. Do you get that? Even people in hell will be worshiping. So anybody can worship. Anybody can pretend. Anybody can go through the motions and emotions. But the way that, but the fact, and everybody can say, oh, we're all worshiping the same God. Well, you might be worshiping him, but Jesus said he's the way. He is the only way. He is the truth and he is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. That's what Jesus said. And he's either Lord or he's a lunatic. You decide. So the deliverance from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God is a gift. It begins with a gift of salvation, and when you receive the forgiveness for your sin that Jesus earned for you when you died on the cross for your sin, uh, you are forgiven. He, he, he didn't automatically forgive you on the cross. He offers you forgiveness on the cross. His death on the cross just simply makes it possible for you to be forgiven. But this idea, well, if Jesus died on the cross, then I'm automatically forgiven. No, you're not. He offers you forgiveness. He paid the price so that you could be forgiven. But you have to receive that forgiveness and apply that in your life. You have to receive forgiveness through repentance of your sin and submission to the Lordship of Christ. Because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. Once that happens, once you receive God's forgiveness for your sin and submit to the lordship of Jesus, then the transition of moving from the kingdom of God or the kingdom of uh, moving into the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, that's when that begins to happen. It's a process, if you will. It is a process. It may happen quickly, but it may take a while. Depends on you. Now, how does that happen? Well, Romans 12, 2 says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, let me paraphrase this for you for our purposes here today. Do not be conformed to the kingdom of the world, but be transformed by the process of God renewing your mind so that you can understand what God's will is and what is good and acceptable and fulfilling. It's important to understand something here. The process of being transformed by God is just that. It is a process. It doesn't happen immediately. It could, but it doesn't. It usually does not happen immediately. It's a growing and maturing process, and God leads you and encourages you and teaches you his truth, and you begin discovering and applying his wonderful truths in your life. It is a process. The salvation is immediate, but the deliverance, the moving from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of heaven is a process. And that's why we need to be so gentle with young Christians and new Christians and immature Christians, because everybody's at a different point in that, in that process. And we need to be encouraging them. And instead of saying, get out of the kingdom of the world, we need to be, come. Come to the kingdom of heaven. Come see this. Let me show you a better way. That's why we have to be so, so careful with young Christians and untaught Christians. And by the way, I'm, this is one of the saddest things that I ever deal with. I deal with this every week. I hear people say this all the time. I never heard that before. You know, that happens in this class. And some of you have been in this class for a long, long time. And some of you will say, you know what? I never, I never heard that before. Why? Why aren't we teaching this? Why isn't this being taught from the pulpits of churches everywhere? You know, why? And, and it's, it's, it's important for us to understand that, that we need the Word of God to help us develop and grow and to transition from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of heaven. 
I want you to see something in this verse that helps us understand the process. The word world, do not be conformed to this world, the word is actually the word aeon. We get the word eon from it. Uh, and it literally means a lifetime. Uh, in other words, do not be conformed to this lifetime. Uh, but in this lifetime, let God take you through the process of renewing your mind so that you can understand what God's will is and what is good and the acceptable thing and what is fulfilling. And for those of you who count how many times I turn the pages, this is the last one. But did you get that? It takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime of God processing you from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of heaven. That's what God is doing in your life right now. He's preparing you. He's developing you. He's maturing you. For what? For eternity. You see, God's looking at the big picture. He's looking at what he has planned for you. You're in boot camp right now. He's looking at what's ahead. He's looking at what God has planned for you for eternity. Surely you don't think that eternity would be like earth, did you? You didn't think eternity would be like a good earth, you know, like a perfect earth. No, 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 no. Let me remind you of a promise that God has made to you. It's in Revelation chapter 21, starting with verse 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. God's going to come live with you in heaven. And they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. Hey, brother. For the former things have passed away. Get this. Pain is not of heaven. Pain is something of the world. Death is not of heaven. Death is something of the world. Sorrow is not something of heaven. It's something of the world. And all of that is going to be behind us. And Jesus is the one who's seated on the throne. It says, he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. <laughs> Guarantee, another guarantee in the Word of God. Do you get that? Behold, I'm making all things new. God is in the process of transforming you from the kingdom of the world to the kingdom of heaven. And he is preparing you for eternity. And in our passage in Matthew, Jesus concludes his teaching about the difficulty of transitioning from the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God with these words. But many who are first will be last and the last first and what he was saying was get this many who are high up in the kingdom of the world will be last in the kingdom of heaven and many who are last in the kingdom of the world will be high up in the kingdom of heaven and I'll be honest with you I'm kind of happy to be somewhere in between you know, I mean, I know I, I know I live a privileged life, you know. I mean, all of us do in America compared to the world. I mean, how many of you could live on $50 a year? But, you know, I, I realize that I'm, I'm, I'm not first in the kingdom. You know, I'm not first in the world. I'm not one of the high ups in the world. But I'm not at the bottom of the rank either. I'm somewhere in between. And I'm going to be okay to be in between. I'm not going to be the first or the last in heaven, but I'm going to be in between. And, you know, as I've said before, I'm going to be happy to be cleaning up after the horses in heaven. That's cool with me. I'm okay with that. That's what God wants me to do for eternity. Not going to get a complaint out of me because I'll be doing it in heaven. By the way, there are going to be animals in heaven. The Bible teaches that. So, I don't know if there will be cats, but there will be some animals in heaven. Well, I'm just saying the Bible doesn't say that there will be cats. It doesn't say that. I'm just, you know, I'm not saying they won't be. I'm just saying I don't know. What I do know is that right now I am committed to letting God 
transform me. That's, what's, I'm, that's what God's doing in my life right now. I'm, I'm committed to letting God transform me by the process of God renewing my mind so that I can understand what God's will is and what is good and acceptable and fulfilling. How about you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your anointed word that gives us insight as to what you're up to in our lives right now. You're changing us. You're challenging us. You're growing us. You're maturing us. You're developing us for eternity. And so, Father, in spite of the sorrow and the pain and the difficulties and the loss that we experience here on earth, we realize that that's just part of you shaping us into what you want us to be for eternity. So we thank you for that. We thank you for what you're doing. And I pray that this week, as you take us through life this week, we'll understand that everything that we encounter, everything that we deal with is part of you transitioning us into the kingdom of heaven. And we praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Next week, life isn't fair. Go away. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.